Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Lunch and Learn. Uh, we are going to be talking about the mammals of Pennsylvania. And joining us is Mindy Marker, Environmental Education Specialist uh, with DCNR. So welcome, Mindy. Hi, thank you for introducing me. Absolutely. So um, Mindy's going to give the presentation today. Um, and if folks have questions at, at any point, feel free to leave them in the comments and we can address them um, towards the end of the presentation, probably. Uh, just another technical note, while we were waiting to go live here, um, we had some internet issues. So if that happens during, during the presentation, um, just please bear with us. We'll try to come back online um, and, and keep going. But just want to give everyone a heads up before we get started. So without further ado, Mindy, I'll let you take it away then. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. So today we're going to be talking about the mammals of Pennsylvania. Um, and that is both uh, past and present. So can anyone name a mammal that once occurred in Pennsylvania, but no longer exists here? Um, I'll give you a few minutes to think about that. And if you have any answers, uh, please put them in the uh, chat box or in the question box. Um, but think about different animals that you might have heard that were once here in Pennsylvania and no longer exist here. I'm sure there's a couple that are going to come to mind, um, but we're going to talk about those animals here in just a moment. Uh, so first of all, I want to discuss what is a mammal. So what are the basic characteristics of mammals? And this might be taking you back to elementary school when you're first learning what a mammal is. Um, but there are five basic characteristics that all mammals share. Uh, mammals are vertebrates, uh, just like birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish, they all have a backbone. Um, so all of our mammals have a skeleton um, with that backbone, and that's what makes them vertebrate animals. They're also warm-blooded, uh, or the correct term for that is endothermic. Uh, and that means that they maintain their own body temperature um, by burning food, using their metabolism. They can keep their body temperatures um, at a cost constant temperature for most of the time. Um, now, obviously, sometimes if we get sick, our body temperature goes down a little bit um, or up a little bit, or if some animals go into hibernation, that might change. Uh, but in general, their body temperatures maintain the same. Um, and that is different from what we call the cold-blooded animals, such as reptiles and amphibians and fish. Um, those exothermic animals have to actually take heat from the sun, from their environment, in order to uh, warm their bodies up. So their body temperatures are much different, um, more similar to their environment. Uh, so that's kind of the difference between the two there. Um, the third characteristic of mammals is that they are born live. They are not born from eggs. Now, I do like to mention there is one exception to that. Um, there's a very ancient uh, primitive group of mammals called the monotremes, um, and that includes the modern-day platypus and the echidna. Uh, those are two animals that come out of Australia. And they are what we call egg-laying mammals. So you can see this photo um, of a person holding a tiny little echidna egg. Um, so those are the only mammals that actually do hatch from eggs. So they're a little bit unique. Um, and then, of course, mammals get their name from mammary glands, which produce milk. So all mammals produce milk for their young. And then the fifth characteristic is that our mammals have hair or fur on their bodies. Um, and now I like to post pictures of whales and dolphins because many people think of them. They are mammals, um, but they don't have hair, right? Actually, not quite correct. Uh, if you can see this humpback whale photo um, very closely around his mouth, you'll notice little bumps. Those are actually hair follicles. Um, so even at, at some point in their development, even whales and dolphins and seals and things like that have hair or fur on their bodies. Uh, so all mammals have that characteristic as well. So I asked you in the beginning, what are some of the mammals that you might have thought of uh, that were here in Pennsylvania at one time but no longer exist here? Uh, when early Europeans arrived in Pennsylvania, uh, they were greeted with a plethora of different wildlife species and an incredible abundance of forests, of trees. Um, in fact, Penn's Woods was actually over 95% forested uh, prior to European colonization. Um, and despite it being mostly forests, it was an incredibly diverse habitat um, with lots of different mixed forests. We had more 
uh, coniferous forests in the north. Um, we had more uh, hardwoods in the south. We even had some mini plains and prairies and things like that. And in fact, the Native American tribes that lived throughout Pennsylvania actually burned uh, many acres of forests um, in order to maintain the land and also to use for agriculture and things as well. Uh, so they were actually managing the land long before Europeans arrived. Uh, so in the northern part of the state, we had animals like moose, and pine marten, and wolverine. Um, in the southern part of the state, we had things like badgers, um, and we had woodland bison, for which Little Buffalo State Park is named. Uh, the woodland bison actually migrated up and down the Appalachian Mountains. And two of the most uh, common apex predators that we had here in PA uh, was the mountain lion and the wolf. Um, so as settlers arrived in this new world and they saw the seemingly endless resources, uh, and for some reason now my PowerPoint doesn't want to change. There we go. They started to exploit them, right? So they started to clear the land in order to make houses, um, in order to build farmlands, but also just to take the timber, right? They needed a lot of wood to make railroads, to make houses, things like that. Um, so they saw it as an endless resource. They were hauling logs out by the hundreds. Um, and they were also harvesting the animals as well. So they used the animals for not only food, but also for clothing. Um, they traded furs for other goods. Um, and they also used them for food, of course, and sport. So with all of this harvesting of both the animals and the plant life in Pennsylvania, Penn's Woods soon became what they called Penn's Desert. Um, so by the turn of the century from the late 1800s to the early 1900s, um, we started to see a major decrease in our forests here in Pennsylvania. And the photo on the left is actually a log boom uh, from the Susquehanna. Basically, it was a large enclosure uh, created within the river itself um, in order to hold logs in place while they waited for the downstream uh, sawmills to accept them. Uh, so thousands and thousands of these logs were being floated down the Susquehanna River. That was the easiest way for them to transform or to transfer them uh, to the sawmills. And you can see the right picture there. Um, that is Pennsylvania's forest up in the northern part of the state, um, what they look like after some of these clear cuts. So vast areas of Pennsylvania's forests were completely eliminated. And of course, the animals were partially eliminated as well. So not only was their habitat gone, uh, but many of these animals were actually killed because the settlers didn't want them here. Uh, so not only were the large animals like elk um, and deer hunted for food, but the large predators were mainly wiped out due to competition. Uh, we didn't want them here killing our livestock, um, attacking our people. So we felt them that they were a threat and we decided that we wanted to remove them. Uh, so early uh, settlers began putting on drives throughout the 16 and 1700s um, in order to drive these air animals out of the area um, and eliminate them, unfortunately, hunt them and kill them. Uh, so one of the greatest drives that we have uh, information on actually happened in Snyder County, uh, not too far from here. Um, it was called The Great Drive of Center County. Um, and an excerpt from a book called The Pennsylvania Mountain Lion um, tells of this story and tells of this uh, recapulation of how many animals were actually harvested during this great drive. Uh, so the book tells of uh, Black Jack Swartz was the name of the gentleman who led this drive, um, along with about 200 other men and boys. So what they did was they got this big group of men together and they encircled an area some 30 square miles around. And basically they created this giant circle with all these men and they slowly drove these animals into the center of it. Um, now hundreds of different animals escaped, usually the faster animals like deer and things like that. Um, but as they moved in, they killed these animals off as they encompassed the circle. Um, and it's just fascinating to me to learn the exact number of animals that they got out of this area. Uh, so this little excerpt says that 41 panthers um, or mountain lions were harvested out of this drive, 109 wolves, 112 foxes, um, 114 mountain cats, so that would be the bobcat, uh, 17 black bears and one white bear. 
uh, only two elk, but 98 deer. So many of them probably escaped out. Um, 111 buffalo, that would be the woodland bison that are no longer here. Um, three fishers, one otter, 12 gluttons. Uh, a glutton is a wolverine. Uh, three beavers and upwards of 500 smaller animals. Um, so very high percentages of predators back then. So lots of mountain lions, lots of wolves and things like that. Um, and the bounties on their fur were very high. So these animals were very well sought after. Um, and unfortunately, they were eliminated from our state very quickly because of that. So who are the mammals that still live here in Pennsylvania? Um, luckily for us, we had several species reintroduced. I'll mention that in a little bit. Um, but we have between 67 and 70 different species of mammals here in Pennsylvania. And I say there's a little bit of a range because some animals can be found in only parts of the state. Um, some we question whether or not they're still here. And then some other animals are categorized as maybe a subspecies of another. Um, but they're somewhere around 70 different different animals here in PA. Uh, mammals. Uh, they represent seven major groups or orders, and they range in size from the least shrew, which is only about two and a half to three inches long, uh, to the Rocky Mountain elk, which can weigh upwards of 800 pounds. Uh, so we have quite a variety of different animals here in Pennsylvania. And we're going to start with my very favorite. Um, it's the most unique mammal here in PA uh, because it is North America's only marsupial. This is the Virginia opossum. Um, we sometimes call it a possum, uh, but a true possum is something that occurs over in Australia, not here in the United States. Um, it is the opossum. It's a little bit different. Um, but marsupials are um, older groups of mammals that have a pouch that they raise their young in. Uh, so the difference between a marsupial and a regular mammal, or what we call a placental mammal, is that the marsupials' babies do not develop near as much as the placental mammal. Uh, so the babies are born very, very tiny, very underdeveloped. In fact, the baby opossum is about the size of a jelly bean, maybe a little bit smaller when it's first born, maybe about the size of the end of your fingernail. Um, and then those babies must actually crawl up into the mother's pouch um, and then that's where they will continue their development until they get big enough like these little babies here um, that they can crawl around on mom. Now opossums also have a couple other unique uh, traits. They have the most teeth of any mammal here in North America. Um, and they also tend to have a lot of babies too. They can have upwards of 15 babies. Um, now, not all of them survive. In fact, only usually about eight or nine of them tend to. I believe this mom here, I think I counted about nine babies hanging off of her. Um, but they do have a lot of young um, and not all of those young will survive to adulthood. Uh, opossums have a lot of other really interesting facts as well. Um, despite looking maybe like not so clean of an animal, they're also known for going through trash and things like that. Um, they're opportunistic omnivores, so they're going to go after whatever kinds of food that they can. Uh, so we often kind of consider them or think of them as a dirty animal, but they're really not. Um, they're very clean. They're very meticulous groomers. They like to keep themselves clean. And for that reason, they actually consume and, and frequently pull off ticks off of their body. Um, and they eat them because they love insects. Uh, so these guys are actually known for picking up and eating lots and lots of ticks and helping to reduce Lyme disease in their area. They're also resistant to many different diseases that a lot of our other mammals can get. Um, rabies is one of them, and it's because their body temperature is just low enough that the rabies virus has trouble replicating in their bodies. Um, so marsupials are kind of unique in that way as well. And then um, opossums, of course, like I said, they're opportunistic omnivores. Um, a lot of people think of them only being active at nighttime, but they're actually active at all hours of the day, um, especially in the wintertime when food is more scarce. Uh, so you can see these guys at any point. And then in the spring and summer, we can sometimes see mothers with young ones out and about during the daytime. Uh, so just seeing an opossum out during the day is not necessarily a cause for alarm. Now, going back to our smallest mammals here in Pennsylvania, the shrews and the moles. Uh, they're a little bit different, but I like to lump them together because they are in the same order or the same group of animals. Um, moles are very round, tubby little animals um, with feet that kind of uh, go out to the sides a little bit. They have very, very large claws. Um, they are made for digging. They're expert diggers. 
Um, and they also can survive in low oxygen environments um, due to a special chemical in their blood, which is kind of fascinating. Moles are often viewed as pests, um, but they're not. They actually only eat insects, so they're actually not harming our garden plants and things like that. Um, they're good for our gardens in some ways because they help to aerate the soil by making tunnels through it. Um, the most unique I have the photo of here on the left is the star nose mole. Um, he has these weird looking tentacle things on his nose um, and they work very much like our hands. Uh, so that star on his nose actually has about 100,000 nerve fibers in it, um, which is five more than what we have in our entire hand. Uh, so it makes it very, very sensitive because these guys don't have good eyesight. Um, it almost looks like he has no eyes at all, but he does have tiny little beady eyes, um, but their eyesight is very, very underdeveloped. So their sense of touch and their sense of smell has to be incredibly good. Uh, shrews are very similar, except they don't have that uh, funny tentacly star-shaped appendage on the end of their nose, um, and their claws are a little bit different. Shrews are a little bit more voracious predators, um, so they have extremely high metabolisms, and in fact, their heart can beat anywhere from 800 to 1,000 times per minute. Um, so they're very fast moving. They have to eat at least 12 times their body weight every single day just to keep the, uh, up that metabolism. Uh, which means that these animals do not hibernate. Um, so shrews can actually be active all year long. They're active underneath the snow, um, trying to find smaller uh, hibernating creatures such as worms and insects and things like that. Um, and they'll even prey on baby mice and things when they're born in the springtime. So they're very voracious predators for being tiny little creatures. Some fun facts about them. Some of our water shrews um, have specialized feet with little hairs on them that actually allow them to walk on water. Um, so the little hairs prevent their feet from breaking the surface tension of the water. Um, and so these guys can actually look like they're walking across water. Um, and in fact, uh, Teddy Roosevelt is one of the first people um, over here to really notice that. And he thought they were fascinating animals. So he actually kept shrews as pets for a number of years, um, kind of studying them and learning a little bit about them, which I think is cool because I love Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> Uh, some of the other smaller animals that we have here in Pennsylvania, we have a variety of species of voles and mice, uh, several species of jumping mice, which are kind of cool because they have these really big back legs. Um, so the two pictures on the top left and right are the meadow and the forest jumping mice. Um, and then on the bottom left, we have um, a native wood rat. It's called the Allegheny wood rat. Um, he's actually considered to be an endangered species here in Pennsylvania. We're unfortunately losing these guys due to loss of habitat. Um, and then we also have what are called the voles. Um, so a lot of people will lump moles, voles, and shrews all into the same category, um, but they're very different. Uh, moles and shrews are going to be eating insects and more of a carnivorous diet. The vole is going to be eating more vegetation, much like the mice and the rats. Um, so the voles are the ones we often think of as being a little bit more destructive sometimes in our backyards and things. Um, but voles are very closely related to lemmings as well as the muskrat, which we'll talk about here in just a moment. Now, unfortunately, we give small mammals like rodents um, a bad name because they're oftentimes pests that inhabit our houses, our garages, our barns, and things like that. Um, but most of our native species are really not those pests. Most of the time, those pests are these three invasive species, these three that are not native uh, to Pennsylvania. And that would be the black ship rat, uh, the Norway rat, and the house mouse. Um, so these three animals were all introduced as soon as... Um, uh, Europeans started arriving in the New World. Um, they came over on ships uh, along with everybody that was coming over, their cargo. Um, and they've been well established here as well as throughout the rest of the world. Um, they're very well adapted to living alongside humans, so they do very well with us. Um, and the more our population expands, the more these guys are going to expand um, into wilder areas and competing with our native animals that are not quite as big of pests as they are. And uh, I like to lump the muskrat and the beaver in together because a lot of people will sometimes confuse one for the other, um, but they are very different. And like I said, the muskrat is much more closely related to the lemming or the lemmings and the voles, um, whereas the beaver is not not near as closely related. 
the beaver is also so much larger. Um, people will sometimes see the muskrats here at Little Buffalo and say, oh, you have beavers in the lake. No, we don't. Um, muskrats usually weigh anywhere from two to four pounds or so. Um, so they're a little bit smaller than a house cat. Beavers can weigh upward of 75 to 80 pounds for large ones. Um, so beavers are very, very large animals. If we had them here in the lake, we would certainly know about it. Um, we have had beavers in the past. Unfortunately, here at Little Buffalo, um, because we're a smaller park um, and with a lot less forest area, we don't want beaver here because they can be very very destructive. Um, they can take down a lot of trees. They can really change the ecosystem here um, with our man-made lakes. So if we do get beavers here, we trap and relocate them. Um, but several other state parks around. Black Mishannon is a great state park if you want to go see beavers. They have a lot of those guys up there. Um, beavers actually caused some major conflicts in the 16 and 1700s. Um, there were several series of wars called the Beaver Wars uh, during that time period. So as European trappers were kind of expanding out west looking for animals to trap, um, they were coming into conflict with uh, both other European nations. So the French and the English came into contact. Uh, conflict with each other, as well as various Native American tribes over the land. Uh, so as we moved across the United States, expanding westward, um, these animals and the desire for these animals caused a lot of tension and conflicts between different tribes and different groups of people. Um, and it's because their pelts were so valuable. Um, beaver pelts were very large because they're large animals. Uh, their pelts were very soft, very thick, and also waterproof. Um, so muskrats and beavers produce an oil that they can actually coat themselves with um, that helps to waterproof their fur. And it makes it very uh, sleek and shiny, um, and it would make very valuable clothing out of beaver fur. Um, so back in the day, a beaver pelt would cost about $80 in today's uh, money uh, for one single beaver pelt. So you can see why they were very valuable, very sought after, and they could be traded for a lot of other commodities. Um, beavers actually have a, another chemical that comes from them uh, called castorium. Uh, or sometimes called castor oil, uh, and it's used in perfumes, cosmetics, uh, even cigarettes and face creams. Uh, so I personally, if I see something in my face cream that has the word castor in it, um, I'm not really thinking about putting that on my face because it does come from the rear glands of a beaver. But for whatever reason, it does have a, uh, um, a chemical in it that helps with perfume scents and things like that, and it makes them very, very valuable. So back in the 1800s and early 1900s, um, castor oil was used in a lot of different products. It was even approved uh, by the FDA as a food additive um, to use in place of vanilla flavoring. So something in it must have a vanilla-y taste to it, and it's actually an approved food flavoring to this day. Um, it's not used very often, thankfully, but it still could be in some of your foods, just to give you a heads up. Um, so that is a little bit about the beaver. We could do an entire program just on them, but we're going to keep moving for the sake of time. Um, the other rodents that we have here in Pennsylvania um, are the squirrel family. And a lot of people just think of gray squirrels um, and maybe chipmunks. But we actually have five different species of squirrels here in PA. Uh, we have two species of flying squirrels, the northern and the southern. We have the red squirrel, uh, the eastern gray squirrel, and then, of course, the fox squirrel, which is a little bit bigger than our gray squirrel. Um, and then we have the chipmunk, and the groundhog is actually in the squirrel family as well. Now, one cool thing about our squirrels, um, they're very specialized in eating nuts. Obviously, they have the very sharp teeth that are ever growing, much like our other rodents. Um, but they actually cache a lot of their food. They don't hibernate in the wintertime. Um, so our squirrels will actually go and cache somewhere from like 12 to 20 times their weight in food um, in order to survive in the wintertime. Their metabolism has to go up a little bit. They have to burn more energy to keep their bodies warm. So they need a lot of food. So that's why in the fall we see them running around gathering as much food as possible um, in order to have that stash for over the winter time. Groundhogs are a little bit different. Instead, they're going to eat as much as they can. Um, they're going to double, almost triple their body weight right before hibernation. And then they're going to go into their burrows and they'll sleep for four to five months um, without barely waking up every now and then maybe to go to the bathroom. Um, and then they're not going to reappear again until spring. So they're considered to be a true hibernator, whereas our other squirrels, not so much. 
Um, all of our squirrels are uh, herbivores or eat plant matter, especially, like I said, nuts and acorns and things, with the exception of the flying squirrel. Um, flying squirrels are actually considered to be omnivorous. And in fact, some of our bluebird trail monitors have actually lost animals in the bluebird boxes, uh, baby birds and adult birds, um, to flying squirrel predation. So I think that's kind of a fascinating fact about these guys. Uh, one thing I like to mention about the groundhogs since Groundhog Day was just last week. Um, groundhogs, like I said, are true hibernators and some fun facts about their hibernation. Um, their body temperature will drop from a normal 99 degrees all the way down to about 40 degrees during hibernation. Their heart rate goes from about 80 beats a minute to only four beats per minute. And then they actually only lose about a quarter of their body weight during that time. So they're very effective at retaining that energy and retaining that body fat um, until they wake up in the spring, which is pretty cool. Porcupines are another mammal that we have in Pennsylvania that a lot of people don't think too much about or you might never have seen. Um, the porcupine is actually a rodent. And in fact, it is the second largest rodent here in Pennsylvania. Um, porcupines obviously are covered in quills, right? And quills are modified hairs. Uh, so they're made out of the same material that our hair is. Um, and many of you know that if you get stuck with the porcupine's quills, um, they're going to stick into your skin. And that's because they have these tiny little microscopic barbs um, at the end of them. And you can only really see it here with a microscope. Um, and those barbs are going to embed into the skin at the rate of about one millimeter per hour. So they actually can go in deeper and deeper. Um, so if you or a pet ever does come in contact with a porcupine, you got to get them to a veterinarian right away um, to get those quills out safely. Um, they don't actually throw their quills. Rather than being able to throw their quills, like I said, they're just like hair and we can't throw our hair at people. Um, so instead, the quills basically only release if something touches them. Uh, so first, a porcupine is going to rattle and shake its quills around. It might stomp it or slap its tail against the ground, and that's a warning to get away. And if that person or animal does not leave the porcupine alone, it will back up very quickly um, and slap the animal with it. Its tail and that's usually how dogs um, and bears and other predators end up with porcupine quills all through their face. Um, they can have 30,000 or more quills on their body along with their regular hair too which is pretty cool. Um, in the winter time these guys eat the inner barks of trees as well as pine needles some things that other animals can't digest um, and in the summertime they eat a lot more leaves and berries and fruits and things like that. They are strictly vegetarian um, and they have one baby per year, like you can see in the photo here, and that baby is called a porky pet. Uh, we have a couple different species of rabbits here in Pennsylvania. A lot of people don't realize we think they're all the eastern cottontail, but they're not necessarily. Um, we actually have two species of cottontails here in Pennsylvania. Uh, the eastern cottontail is the most common, most uh, widespread, but there's also an Appalachian cottontail, which is endangered, and it's found up in the mountains, uh, mountainous regions of the state, um, and we actually don't really know the range of this rabbit very good because it's so rare, um, and it also looks nearly identical to the eastern cottontail. So the genetics are different, but they look very similar, and to the average person, these animals are going to look identical. In the northern part of the state, we also have the snowshoe hare, um, and that's the photo on the right, the guy with the uh, white patches on his fur. Um, so snowshoe hares are unique because they will actually change their fur color in the wintertime. Uh, so as fall approaches, daylight shortens, that triggers their body to start growing this white fur, and that allows them to blend in much better in the wintertime. And now one of the bad things about having that white fur is that some seasons, some of these winters we've been having have had a lot less snow than usual. Um, we haven't had constant snow cover. Uh, so being pure white in a brown environment um, can be a bad thing if you're a snowshoe hare. Uh, the differences between hares and rabbits, um, hares are actually born with fur and with eyesight. They're not born blind and naked like rabbits are, so they're a little bit different in that way. 
And then rabbits tend to be not as strong of runners, um, so they like to or prefer habitats with a lot of cover. They're more likely to try and run into cover or run into a burrow if something threatens them. Um, whereas a hare is a much stronger runner, he's much faster, um, he's going to try and prefer to run away. So they can be found in slightly different ha uh, habitats for that reason. And then again to some smaller animals here in Pennsylvania are bats um, and we do do an entire program just on bats so we're just going to touch a little bit on them. Um, we have nine resident species of bats here in Pennsylvania, three of which actually migrate south in the winter time. Um, so of those nine species of bats, five of the six that hibernate here in Pennsylvania are all becoming more endangered. Um, and it's due to a disease called white nose syndrome that's been affecting bats across the United States. Um, it's an introduced fungal disease from Europe uh, that came over here in the early 2000s. Um, and basically what it does is it wakes bats up during hibernation by growing on the face and the ears of the bat. It causes them irritation and they wake up in the winter time uh, when they don't want to be waking up, when there's no food available. Um, and why this is important is because bats are so small, they're so unique, uh, they're so not heavy, they're so lightweight, they don't put on a lot of bat, uh, body fat like some of our other animals, like groundhogs say. Um, so bats can't put on a whole lot of body fat in order to prepare for hibernation. Uh, so unfortunately for them, if they wake up, outside of when they're supposed to, they use up that little tiny bit of body fat that they do have stored, and then they have no more body fat to go back to sleep. Uh, so these bats are unable to go back into hibernation. Uh, they fly around looking for food, and unfortunately, many of them end up starving to death before spring arrives. Um, so white nose syndrome has been killing almost all of our bat species that hibernate here, um, with the exception of the big brown bat. Uh, so a couple different photos I have here up in the top left is a big brown and a little brown bat. Uh, sleeping next to each other, the long-eared bat, uh, the silver-haired bat, which is actually one of our migratory species, as well as the red bat. Um, so if you come back to Little Buffalo this summertime, we do bat programs. We take the bat detector out and walk around and look for bats. Um, that's a really cool activity that we do here in the park, and you can learn a lot more about them then. Whoops. Um, the bobcat is our most abundant wildcat in North America, um, and it can be found across Pennsylvania in a wide variety of habitats, sometimes even suburban places where you might never expect to see them. They're very shy and elusive, so your chances of seeing one in the wild is very slim. I've only seen one in my entire life in the wild. Um, the female cats are actually more territorial than the males, um, so they cover smaller areas, but they do not tolerate other women near their territory. They might cover a territory of about five square miles, um, which is pretty big, but considering the male can cover up to 30 square miles, he has a much, much broader territory, um, and he'll come in contact with many other bo uh, male bobcats without too much conflict. Um, males and females uh, do not take care of the, or I should say males do not help to take care of the kittens, um, but males and females will hunt together and will hang out together um, up in, from late winter up until the breeding season or so, which is usually around March or April. Um, and then the babies are, are born after just a few weeks. Um, and then the kittens will stay with mom throughout the year into the next year, and then she'll kick them out uh, the next spring, and usually they're off on their own at that point. Um, some cool facts about bobcats is they can actually uh, run up to 30 miles per hour. They can jump 12 feet. Um, and there have been instances of adult bobcats taking down full-grown deer. Um, so while they prefer small prey like mice and birds and things like that, they do have the ability to take down larger animals if they need to. And some other predators that we have here in Pennsylvania are the foxes, uh, the gray foxes on the left and the red fox on the right. The gray fox is actually considered to be a true native of Pennsylvania. It's a forest dwelling fox that was certainly here prior to Europeans. The red fox, possibly not so much. Uh, so red foxes are more... Um, 
accustomed to or more habituated to uh, rural environments like agricultural areas, prairies, farm fields, and things like that. Um, and we don't think that they were very common in Pennsylvania prior to Europeans arriving. Uh, so when Europeans arrived, they eliminated the gray wolf, they eliminated the cougar, um, and instead then the red fox and the coyote moved in and took the place of those predators. Um, now these two foxes, like I said, they are considered predators, they are considered carnivores, um, but they do actually eat plant matter too. So they'll be found eating berries, uh, fruits, and seeds, and things like that. And in fact, the gray fox is almost considered omnivorous. It will eat just about anything that it can get its uh, teeth on. The gray fox is also unique in that he has semi-retractable claws um, and slightly rotatable wrists, which allow him to climb trees. Uh, so he's one of only two canine species in the world that can actually climb trees, which is pretty cool. We have lots of foxes here, uh, Little Buffalo State Park, mostly red fox. Um, red fox tend to like to den closer to people, so we usually have several red fox dens here in the park. Um, and the reason for that is because their predator, the coyote, um, is usually a little bit further away from people, not so, not so close. Uh, so red foxes actually feel safer when they're closer to people. Um, the coyote, like I said, is another not true native of Pennsylvania. Um, back in the day, we had the wolf instead. And our eastern coyote is actually not full coyote. He's actually a hybrid of two different wolf species as well as the western coyote. Um, so as things changed when Europeans arrived, these different canine species kind of moved around the country. Um, they intermixed a little bit. And some of our coyotes actually have domestic dog genes in them as well. Um, which is kind of fascinating. Um, but we sometimes hear the word koi wolf or koi dog um, termed, but technically our coyote is a mixture of all of those different canines, which is why it's a little bit larger and a little bit different than the western coyote. Um, these guys really have no social structure. Um, they usually are solitary or sometimes in pairs. Um, we don't see them hunting in packs like wolves do. Now, they will have family units. So if they do have a, a litter of puppies, those puppies will stay with them until about adulthood. And then sometimes we'll see those multiple coyotes hanging out together. Um, but they do not stay with the group for their entire lives like wolves do. So they're a little bit different in that aspect. Very cunning very elusive, um, very good at living near people without being detected. Um, so these guys have uh, definitely learned to evolve alongside humans. They can even be found in major cities, which is pretty cool. Um, the black bear is another animal that's evolved very well to uh, human settlement. Um, even though we don't see them too much here at Little Buffalo, they are around. Uh, we sometimes see them very, very early in the morning before anybody arrives in the park. Um, but they are unique in that they range in size for quite a bit. Um, average female black bears might be 75 to 100 pounds or so, um, but large males can reach upwards of over 800 pounds in some parts of the state. Uh, so these animals range quite a bit in size. Um, they come in a variety of different colors, not just black. Uh, so we see these brown or cinnamon colored bears every now and then. Sometimes we see white V's or spots on their front. Um, but also if you go out west, you can sometimes see what are called glacial bears, which are silver colored, or even white bears, uh, ghost bears as they sometimes call them. Um, in central PA, black bears are not true hibernators, um, so they will kind of go in and out of hibernation, especially the males or the females with older young. Um, they might wake up during hibernation, come out, look for food. Um, the only ones that are going to stay in their den the entire time is going to be females with newborns. Um, so females enter the den pregnant, they have their babies in the den, um, and then those babies will stay with them. Uh, while they go in and out of sleep until springtime, and that's when she's going to bring the babies out. Um, the PA Game Commission right now has a really cool bear cam on uh, one female black bear that actually denned under someone's back porch. Um, so they'll have that live stream bear cam on all winter long until she leaves with those cubs in the spring. So if you get a chance, check that out. It's really cool. 
uh, smaller and uh, small but mighty animals that we have here in Pennsylvania that everybody I think knows is the skunk, right? And we actually have two species of skunks that occur in Pennsylvania. Uh, the spotted skunk is much smaller and only occurs in certain parts of the far uh, western part of the state, I believe. Um, but the striped skunk is found across Pennsylvania. And that's the bigger picture, the one with the mom carrying a baby. Um, and the striped skunk has a lot of very, very good defenses, but its best known defense is its spray. Um, so the spray that a skunk emits is actually flammable. Um, it can cause temporary blindness due to the irritation uh, that it causes to your eyes. Um, and they can spray over 10 feet. Now they try not to spray right away. They try to warn you first. Uh, so most skunks will get up on their front feet and they'll do this little funny dance with their tail up in the air. Um, so if you see that, the skunk is not actually performing for you. He's trying to warn you to get away from him before he sprays. Um, it's easy to identify a skunk with that black and white coloration. Uh, we call that warning coloration. And if you just remember, the stripes follow the business end. Uh, so for both the spotted and the striped skunk, you can see the lines go across the body and they point to the dangerous part of that animal, which is pretty cool. Um, and all of our animals or a lot of our animals are well evolved to know what skunks are and to stay away from them. Uh, the only animals that we have problems with or our domestic dogs. I know my dog used to get into skunks a lot. And skunks are members of the weasel family, as are the fishers and the otters. Uh, so some people have never heard of a fisher, sometimes called a fisher cat, but it's not a true cat. Um, the fisher is actually a weasel, large weasel um, that was native to the state. It was actually extirpated or eliminated from the state in the 1800s. Um, and it's recently be, been reintroduced. Uh, so throughout the 1960s and 1970s, um, neighboring states as well as Pennsylvania began to reintroduce the fisher um, into their states. And these guys have actually had stable populations ever since. So we actually do have hunting seasons now, or trapping seasons, I should say, um, for the fisher in PA. Despite being called a fisher, it doesn't really eat fish. It actually is omnivorous, eating a variety of plant and animal material. Um, but its favorite prey are actually small rodents and birds. Uh, so it likes squirrels and chipmunks and things like that. Um, so it's usually found in forested areas, not necessarily near water. And that's definitely different from the otter, which is a true water predator. Um, so the otter is always found near or around large bodies of water, large rivers and lakes. Um, and it does eat almost entirely fish and aquatic uh, invertebrates. Uh, so they are very, very carnivorous as opposed to the fisher, which likes to eat other stuff. Um, both the otter and the fisher, like I said, were eliminated or almost eliminated from the state, um, but they have both been reintroduced and are doing very, very well across the state. Um, we don't have otter here at Little Buffalo yet, but they are in parts of the Juniata River, um, not too, too far from here. So eventually we could possibly have them in our lake. And I think that would be pretty cool if we did. Um, the smaller members of the weasel family, uh, the first one at the top left-hand corner we have the most of here at Little Buffalo, and that is the mink, uh, the largest member of the weasel family. I'll hold up some furs here. So the mink is a very, very uh, large member of the weasel family, considering the other two, the long-tailed um, and the short-tailed weasels, are much, much smaller. Um, so the mink is at the top left, the long-tailed is the top right, um, the short-tailed weasel is the bottom left, and the least weasel is the bottom right. Um, the least weasel is really tiny. Uh, despite that picture, he looks kind of big. He's only about three to four inches long, so very, very small predators. Um, and these guys are very elusive, very uh, hard to find, hard to see. Um, you're more likely to see their tracks than to ever see one of these guys in person. Uh, now, the minks here at Little Buffalo have actually gotten to be pretty brave. Uh, so sometimes a, a walk along the Fisherman Creek Trail, you might be able to actually see these guys. Um, very common. They like to hunt along water, whereas the other weasel species like to hunt along farm fields and agricultural areas and uh, forest edges. And they are all strictly carnivorous. Even though this least weasel, he's eating some berries down here. Um, these guys mostly just eat meat and a lot of it. 
Two other weasel species that we may or may not have in the state. Um, the, the American badger has been reported in parts of the very, very southern edge of Pennsylvania. Um, and the pine martin has been seen a couple times in one or two counties in the very northern part of the state. Um, but these two are actually considered to be extirpated or exterminated out of the state. We tend to agree that they're no longer here. And one of our most infamous of mammals is the raccoon. We have lots of raccoon problems here at Little Buffalo. Um, unfortunately, these guys can become fairly tame, fairly used to people, and we often have uh, visitors trying to feed these guys um, in the summertime when they come and camp or, or picnic with us. Um, it's very, very dangerous to try and feed these animals. Um, they do become used to people very, very quickly, um, and they are what we call a rabies vector species. Um, so they are an animal that we do not want to come into close contact with for that reason. Um, and that just simply means that they're more likely to get rabies than some others. Um, this small picture of the young one here on the left, this was a problem raccoon that I had to remove a few years ago. Um, some people were feeding him marshmallows and things, and he did not want to leave. I actually had to get a catch pole in order to remove him. Uh, so please, if you come here and you see our raccoons, please do not try to feed them. Uh, give them their space, give them their distance, um, and they'll leave us alone if we leave them alone. We have lots of white-tailed deer here at the park. Of course, everybody does all across the state. In fact, white-tailed deer populations are at an all-time high. Um, they're incredibly abundant throughout the state. Uh, here's one of our does out back. She was eating an apple. Um, deer obviously are completely herbivorous, so they're eating mostly plants and, and nuts and fruits and things like that. Um, the fawns are born covered in spots. And that helps them to blend into the forest floor. Um, if you come across a fawn this spring, Spring, uh, laying somewhere, maybe in your backyard, maybe even ne next to your porch or in a flower bed. Um, you never want to touch the fawn. You never want to assume that it's abandoned because this is what white-tailed deer do. They abandon their fawns throughout the day while they go to feed, um, and then they'll return at some point during the night to check up on their fawn and feed it. Um, so it's completely normal to have fawns laying in the grass or fields and things all by themselves. Um, mom is usually not too far away, although she could be up to a mile away, um, but she will return for that fawn. If for some reason you see the fawn laying in the same place for several days, if you see injuries on the fawn, such as flies, or you can see blood or something like that, or if the fawn is crying, those are reasons to believe that that fawn may be abandoned. And at that point, you would want to call a wildlife rehabilitator um, in order to have someone or the game commission have someone come out and check up on that animal. Um, so I can talk more about that in the questions if you guys have afterwards, but we're going to keep moving to our last big animal, the biggest here in the state, that is the Rocky Mountain Elk. Um, so why do we have the Rocky Mountain Elk here in Pennsylvania? Uh, well, our Eastern Elk, unfortunately, was completely eliminated across its entire range. So it went completely extinct. Um, in, the, in the early 1900s, we decided that we wanted elk back in Pennsylvania. Um, out in Yellowstone, they had too many elk they were trying to get rid of. And so we paid the price of just shipping the elk across the United States, and we began reintroducing them into the northern part of the state. Um, so if you go up around Elk County, around the Benazet area and some of the surrounding areas, you can see the herd of almost a thousand or more um, Rocky Mountain elk that exists in Pennsylvania. So who manages the mammals of PA? That would be the Pennsylvania Game Commission, um, established all the way back in 1895. Uh, they manage all of our mammal species as well as all of our bird species, which could be over 400 different animals. Um, what they don't manage is fish, reptiles, amphibians, and insects. Um, so the fish, reptiles, and amphibians are managed through the Fish and Boat Commission, which is a separate entity. Um, this is not funded by our tax dollars. It is funded entirely by license sales, uh, sporting goods taxes, such as taxes on ammo and guns, um, and also natural resource sales. Uh, so timber sales, uh, natural gas uh, and mineral sales, and things like that on game lands. Uh, we divide our animals into game animals, which would be bear, deer, elk, um, snowshoe, hare, squirrels, and groundhogs. And then we also have 
small game animals as well. We have the fur bearers. Uh, they would be the animals that are often trapped um, in order to sell their fur. So beaver, bobcat, coyote, um, et cetera. And we do other programs on these animals. If you want to learn more about fur bearers, we have programs on just that, um, as well as our game animals too. Uh, so does anybody have any questions on our general overview of the mammals of Pennsylvania? So at this point, I'll open it up if anybody has any questions. If not, I'd just like to mention that we are doing a variety of different lunch and learn series um, at Little Buffalo. It's called the Virtual Lunchtime Lectures. Um, we've been doing them throughout January and February. Uh, March's schedule is going to be coming up here soon. I'm hoping to get that done here at some point today and get that out on our Facebook page. Um, if you don't already follow us on Facebook, uh, Little Buffalo State Park, you can see all of our upcoming events, uh, both virtual and in person, once we get to do them here in the park. Um, we have our fingers crossed for this summer. Hopefully we'll be able to give you um, lots of in-person programs as well as continue these virtual ones because we have had a lot of uh, good success reaching people way outside of our area with virtual. Um, so there's some good sides and some bad sides to this virtual stuff. But if that's everything. Yeah, hey, maybe I don't think. Oh, oh, we do have a question. Okay. All right. So Mary wants to know, do opossums carry rabies? So they can get rabies. Um, it's not completely unheard of. There's been instances of it, but they are much, much less likely to get it than any other animal in Pennsylvania. And that is because as a marsupial, their body temperature is slightly lower than most other mammals in PA. And the rabies virus likes to replicate at higher temperatures of like 98 plus. Um, so I believe their body temperature is like 95 or something like that. Um, so they tend to not get it. It's not impossible, um, but they're considered to be not a rabies vector species for that reason. Surprisingly, I'm sorry, surprisingly, rabies vector species in PA, obviously coyotes, foxes, uh, raccoons are the big ones that we know of. Um, Feral cats are considered as one of those, um, but groundhogs are actually considered to be a rabies vector species. So they're a species that actually gets it um, more often than other animals in Pennsylvania. And I'm not really sure why that is. So um, I actually had a question um, about porcupines. So you mentioned that their quills are hair. Um, so can they snuggle with their youngs or each other? Like, do they have control? Like to you know release or not kind release of, yeah like, kind of yeah so um when porcupines are born their quills are born very very soft um so they're obviously able to be born without harming the mother um and then mom underneath her belly she doesn't have those quills it's kind of unprotected um which is where one of the things that people think about with fishers is they say well fishers are vicious predators of porcupines because they flip them over and they attack their underbelly but that's actually not true um they attack their face which is a little more horrifying um but their underbellies are actually somewhat exposed and that's so that they can nurse their young without the quills getting in the way um I would say they can kind of relax them um, in order to interact with other animals, obviously for breeding and such like that. Um, but they really don't have any control of making them soft or making them not come out at all. Um, so I'm sure porcupines get stuck by each other every now and then, um, but they don't interact much. Um, they're very solitary animals. They tend to stay away from each other except in the breeding season. And then of course the mothers with babies. Okay. I don't think I'll ever forget porky pup. <laughs> <That's what laughs> <I said>. yep. <laughs> porky pup. That's really cute for the name for the young. So yeah. great. Uh, yeah, I don't see any other questions coming through, but I, I mean, we got a lot of accolades. Everyone really enjoyed the program. It was very interesting, Good. very fascinating. So thank you so much for having your 
your your time and your expertise yes. and sharing that great information with us, Mindy. Yeah, great. And like I said, if you guys want, um, unfortunately, I have to require people to sign up for my programs. Um, so if you're interested in any of my programs at Little Buffalo, you can sign up for them. If something happens and you can't make it, it's okay. You don't have to worry about like, oh, well, I signed up. I have to cancel. Um, we actually can permit a lot of people to join in. I think I have my limit set at 100 and we haven't reached that yet. Um, but I'd love to try and get more people out there. I think the most we had was a little over 50. Um, so, you know, we've been having good success with them and we're also recording them and I'm hoping to get a nice file folder sometime that we can put them all in and make them available for the public. Um, we did do this program on our end as well. So it was very, very similar. Um, but we can do these programs in addition to your lunch and learns as well. If you have any more that you want to do, just let me know. Great. Great. Thank you so much, Mindy. Really appreciate yeah. it. Yep. All right. Yep. No problem. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye.